and welcome to the inaugural episode of Media MD. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. On Media MD, each week we prescribe each other a piece of media or pop culture that the other person has somehow missed. Cool. So uh, I think I'm going first. Yep, sure. Uh, so today I'm bringing the book by Matthew Riley called Seven Ancient Wonders, or Seven Ancient Wonders. for those of you in the States... Seven Deadly Warriors. It's one of those books that Wait, got... Seven Deadly Warriors? Or seven Sorry, Deadly... Seven Deadly Wonders. Right, um, okay. Warriors is the sequel. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, uh, in fact, while I was doing the research for this one, I found out there's a fourth book coming out, and that got oh, me man. very excited. How, <laughs> what's the time gap between these books? Uh, he writes, like, a lot of other books. So, like, there was another one called The Graves of Giants coming out in between. So, like, if he's doing them in order, it's probably, like... I think he brings out about a book a year. Like, mm. Um... But anyway, yeah, it was one of those books that got renamed when it went to the States. Mm. Like, I think the first Harry Potter had that done. So he's, is he an Australian author? Yeah, he's Australian. He's from uh, Sydney. Mm. Um, Local boy. Yeah. Uh, But I'd describe him as the Michael Bay of authors. Okay. So (laughs) in my head now, I'm imagining a lot of writing about explosions. Yeah. um, It's it's kind of a weird thing. So it's like, honestly, the plots are fairly... Mm. Bland. Yep, Michael the, char- Bay, yep. the characters are very flat. Yep, Michael Bay. Yep. Um, but the a- the action is really well written, and that's okay. a, that's an odd thing to say about yeah. a novel. Well, how do you describe well written? Because like I'm imagining like for Michael Bay, it's like well done practical effects and things that you'd see obviously staples explosions and lens. Yeah, lens so like lenses. yeah, it's like big action scenes. So like the the Seven Ancient Wonders series is mm. is very Indiana Jonesy. Mm. Um, it's like a modern day guy goes and raids old ruins and stuff for treasures. Mm. National, it's a national um, treasure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, it, it, I don't know, Michael Bay just writes really good action scenes, and I honestly feel like you'll probably have to read it to understand that statement <laughs> because <laughs> okay. It, but like, it's it's very thrilling, and yeah, like they're all very intense, high octane, and he he he's very good at creating these intricate like fight scenes where there's like mm. ten groups of people shooting each other, and you can sort of completely follow what's happening, and also. Yeah, I don't know. it's a really unique thing, and like, it's a shame that he can't back it up by creating more interesting plots and characters, <laughs> a more well-rounded um, author. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well. But like, he's you know, and it's also a shame. Like, he's had like five or six of his books go to become movies, and then that like the, for whatever they real reason well or... they've all failed. Like, yeah. the movies have never come out. Like, the deals oh. sort of either at the script writing phase Not or even, like, like pre-production. No, yeah, they've never even gone into production, as far as I'm aware, and that doesn't Jesus. really make sense to me because these would be yeah, much, better, much better movies, movies than they are books. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, one of my favorite parts as well is at the end of each book, there's like an interview with him. Mm. Uh, I don't know who's asking the questions. Yeah. I believe he may be interviewing yeah, himself. He's interviewing himself <laughs> for sure. Um, but they're I, I get that they're pretty. They're kind of comedy gold. Mm. Um, because he talks about the plot and the characters and like, I don't know if he wrote a very different book to what I read, but like, it's very interesting. Yeah. So he's like, to just... discuss. yeah. So that, I, I often get a kick out of reading it at the end. He talks about like this character development that sort of went on through the book that apparently went straight over my head because, yeah, yeah. because they were just he's shooting the bad guys. Yes. <laughs> um, it reminds me of this interview. I saw an interview once with M. Night Shyamalan, Shyamalan, where he I know was, the guy. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you're familiar. um, where he was talking about how his films had just gotten these, had been critically panned, and he felt that it was unjustified. And it's just like he's in his own little bubble of, <laughs> Bit of Tommy he's a Wiseau. creative. And he, yeah, he's a Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> he's ex- exactly. He sounds like a real Tommy Wiseau or a yeah. Neil Breen. I, or, I don't think he's he's quite that that delusional mm. uh, as Tommy Wiseau. Maybe the M. Night Shyamalan's a good comparison. Mm. It's like, yeah, he just sort of, he talks about character development and he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like... Okay, <laughs> so this one you have in front of you, The Great Zoo of China, is another one from the same series, is that right? Uh, no, this is just the same author. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think this was his most recent book until mm. September this year when the fourth, the fourth one in the in the Seven Ancient Wonders chapters comes out. Okay, so let's talk about Seven Ancient Wonders. Yeah. So he's going to each of the Ancient Wonders? Yeah. Like um, so I mean, of whatever. I don't, I don't want to spoil the plot too pyramids. much, but yeah, essentially... It, there ends up being this big ancient conspiracy, sort of mm. Dan Brownish, but not as mm, yes. clever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, big conspiracy about uh, essentially he has to go to the se- each of the seven ancient wonders and sort of do some stuff, otherwise the world's going to end. Oh boy! Um, and and it, it, like, there's bits of magic and is it like kind of twenty twelve Mayan prophecy style? 
Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, and then and then like that whole angle really takes off in the third, the second and third books. Okay. Um, yeah. So how many of the ancient wonders does he visit? But he visits all seven. So there's it's the seven ancient wonders, and then the second book is he called the does s- another lap around. It's, well, it's called the six sacred stones. And then, oh, I see. And then book three is the five greatest. Oh my warriors. god, it's counting down. Yeah, it is. What um, happens when he gets to the one? He sacred said that'll be the final chapter. Oh, um, so you know, zero. like twenty thirty eight or whatever. There's it's gonna no be. Blast it's, off. <laughs> it's gonna be thrilling. <laughs> Alright. Um, 2038, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, at this rate. But yeah, so so it's sort of each one's a separate chapter dealing with a new sort of set of artifacts, but yeah, it's 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 very uh, it's very Indiana Jonesy, Uncharted, National Treasure, okay. Tomb Raider. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get the kind of genre that we're going for here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Indi- it's the Indiana, like Indiana Jones was the yeah. the pioneer, right? I, and it's a genre like, I personally love. I, yeah, of I, course. I always love these kind of like stories. action um, adventure. Yeah, exactly. And the old, like, you know, it's like, oh, ancient cultures take all their ruins for, okay. for our stuff. So who's our main character? Who's our main ca- well-developed or not quite <laughs> character? Um, so this is actually the only one, I believe, except for maybe a few of his one-off novels that stars mm-hmm. an Australian guy. So we've got this guy called Jack West Jr. He's... Jack West Jr. <laughs> yeah, um... <laughs> He's like Australian ex SAS or something, but mm. he's just like a very generic all round action hero. He's just an action hero. Um, except what separates him from the rest mm. is that he actually has this like bionic arm. Oh man. Uh, Cause his arm got cut off from like the elbow down, I think mm. it was. Mm. Anyway, and so he, his nerdy friend who's called like Wizard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a code name. He, he has like yeah. a real. He has actual name, human name. But yeah, of course. I, I, his code name's Wizard. And yeah. yeah, like they all have code names. What's Jack West Jr.'s code name? <sighs> Is it like Soldier or like I've, Scorpion? I've actually forgotten. No, it's like it's like Jackal or Oh yeah. Maybe that's his enemy. It's some kind of dog related thing. Anyway. Uh, cause he's loyal and shit. There's symbolism. There. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, okay. oh yeah. It's well written for, no, sure, yeah. for sure. And wizard is a uh, tech wizard. He presumably. is. Yes. Mm. Um, and so he built Multiple Jack layers. West Jr. out of bionic arm, which certainly comes in handy. Uh, throughout is, is his, it like Inspector Gadget stuff? Like it can, it has like, no, it's just, it, it's almost like, it's almost like imagine if he was super powered, but only in half of his left arm. Well, like Winter Soldier, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, except only half the arm, so he's like half as cool as Bucky. Right, right. <laughs> he's half a he's half a winter soldier. Um, so strength just and I assume you can like plug it into USB ports and no, hack things. No, it's, it's literally just like just super strength. Strong? Yeah. Oh, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> maybe they're saving um, that for. But yeah, he he uses it pretty well. Uh, like it comes up in one of these action sh- action scenes. But yeah. all right. Yeah, so, yeah, I was like, oh, book, that'll be classy, and then I picked this one, so no. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's what I'm prescribing you this week to catch up uh, with something you missed. And we are back. There's the sound effect, thank you, thank you. Um, God. So, Seven Deadly Wonders. Yep. I read it. I, I did it in three sessions. So about a quarter of the book, a quarter of the book, and then I just fucking gunned it and binged it the was last that good, half. Huh? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to set the tone and say there is so much wrong with this book, but <laughs> it still undeniably was a great experience for me. Like, it was just like, I wouldn't even say, like, it had a lot of things where I would say so bad it's good applies, but even just, it was weirdly gripping not even on that level just on a, a straight mm. level so i think that's sort of that writing style i was talking about where yes. like he has those action scenes that are the very intricate and compelling um despite the rest of it sort of, sort of being yeah being being so basically like the the characters are basically not there the, <laughs> the plot is very generic and very stupid um let's talk about you mentioned in the preamble part of this episode that it would really work as a movie, and that I think is the most true statement I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, yeah, he writes I, this book like he's writing a screenplay. I, a I agree, ways. and I think if you if you went to read more of his books, you realize there are they all uh, it's the same. Um, I'm going to point to a couple of examples. Each scene basically has its own title, and you can see clear breaks where. And this is where the camera will cut, and we'll cut to the next yeah. scene. You can really feel it. Um, and he even he even includes like little maps. Yeah, so I don't know if we discussed that. You no. do, did you mention? No, that? I, I didn't bring that. There up, are pictures. But... This is basically a picture book. I'd say <laughs> no. each big set piece has 
three or four maps that describes the interior layout and all the traps and how they all work. Yeah. Um, um, and again, that would help for like pulling it into a movie because he's done some of the set. It design. helps because his descriptions otherwise are not good enough. To, <laughs> like if you didn't have the, disc- the the pictures, you would not understand what the hell was going on. Oh yeah. On. Like he, you're right. He, he sort of relies on you knowing what the map is. So when he says they're hiding behind the pillar yes, near Blah, there is, like, you I've, need to know. You can see my book is full of poster notes here because there are so many things that I wanted to talk about with this movie. There is one part where he's talking about a map or something. I'm not going to bother looking through my 20 or 30 poster notes to find it, but instead of writing anything, he says, and they looked at a map and it looked like this. And then there's a doctor and there's a picture of a map. And it's just like, all right, is that really what we're doing here? Yeah, um, his, his writing style is not the most <laughs> complex. Yes. And there's one more thing I'd like to point out, which is multiple, multiple times throughout this book, he will leave... He'll cut halfway through a sentence for suspense. Oh, oh yeah, he'll at put the like end a of a dash chapter or, or something. No, no, not even at the end of a chapter. He'll be like, and the helicopter blew up, dot, dot, dot. And then he starts a new line, dot, dot, dot. Because it got shot by this other helicopter. <laughs> and he leaves little line breaks for yeah. you to build up the suspense. And that's something I really like about this yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just so works. crazy. <laughs> it's just so, it's so, like, just nonsense in so much of it but it really works for sure because um, this one uh one of the things that features in a lot of his books mm. and i'm pretty sure it's in this one is the mag hook did they have that uh, in this one? i don't think so there are there are grappling hooks that they use at certain points like okay at one point, yeah guy attaches some explosives to a grappling hook and shoots it to yeah. like blow up a roof or something um okay. a lot of explosions as we mentioned yes. as you mentioned there are a lot of explosions <laughs> in this book and there are a lot of traps in this book. This yeah. book is mainly about traps. And so that's that's probably partially unique to this one. Yeah. Um, the, and that it sort of falls in with that concept that they're they're invading these ancient ruins. Yeah, it's ruins like Tomb Raider the traps. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that was probably when he was writing this. That was like the theme. He was coming up with all the, the traps. traps. Yeah. Um, um, and I would say the traps are one of the main parts where the diagrams help because some of these traps were so nonsensical. <laughs> like there are. There are traps with crocodiles and snakes that are in ruins that are thousands of years old. And as I'm reading it, I just can't help but think, how did, how they, did they survive in this? Um, he must have created all these mini ecosystems that just somehow <laughs> funnel crocodiles into these traps. Uh, my, Very complicated. My favorite part, maybe I've just forgotten this explanation because yes. I haven't read the book for quite a few years. Yes. But so uh, the, Essentially, the plot is they need to get all the parts of the capstone. They need to find these seven golden parts of the, of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was sitting at the top of the Great Pyramid, and then they use it to conduct this ritual. Yeah. Which can uh, which either be stops. done to save the world or to attain ultimate power, basically. Yeah. And yet, all of these parts were hidden behind deadly traps, <laughs> meaning that it was quite likely no one would be able to get them, and yes, thus the world would end. Really <laughs> Presumably, it's kind of... So this was built by, in part, Alexander the Great, and in part some pharaoh, Im- Imohotep three or something, yeah. I can't remember, but presumably what they were thinking was, oh, you know, in 2,500 years' time, because it works on this 2,500-year cycle, or 3,000 years, whatever it is, in that amount of time, we'll still be around and we'll be able to collect all the pieces, but we don't want anyone else to be able to do it unless we specifically have told them to do it. Yeah. We don't want anyone but our followers to be able to do it. And that brings up something else that I'd like to talk about, which is that he takes a lot of creative license with making up this cult the cult of Amon Ra oh, and yeah. then injecting it into the Freemasons uh, <laughs> followers of it the Catholic Church it's revealed shockingly in this book is just a front for um, Egyptian worship which was one of my favourite parts of um, the book I mean that was sort of where I brought that Dan Brown comparison yes previously yes. it's a bit of it's a bit of a Dan Brown trope as well it's like oh this big ancient society that's hundreds of years old you thought this is what it was about well it's yeah. about some sort of paganism. the catholic church is not actually about catholicism <laughs> it's very and it even says thinly veiled in the book thinly veiled <laughs> egyptian worship and they point to like one example which can support this <laughs> like jesus kind of shares some similarities with blah and i mean i'm not a religious man and i know that you know a lot of like Christmas can be traced back to a pagan holiday and blah blah blah, but even so, <laughs> it's very. It, it, he takes it pretty far, doesn't See, he? Because what's what's then interesting is um, Jesus is actually a central part of the plot of the third book. Ah, oh, um, that's pretty weird. Yeah, <laughs> and it, come, it starts to become a bit convoluted by there. And I uh, again, it's been quite a while since I read that book, but I think that's one of those situations where he just tends to forget how much 
he pretended like Christianity wasn't a thing in the first <laughs> yeah. and it just is again in the it's third just one. suddenly it's a thing again but, um, I mean a bit of a spoiler for the third one but it's, oh, about, no. it's about the five greatest warriors and so mm-hmm. they, they have to go find these things in the tombs of the five greatest warriors and who are the five greatest well, warriors so Jesus is one of them <laughs> of course because the known term... for his sword fighting ability <laughs> Jesus well, so the term warrior turns out to be a very loose translation right. they just course. mean powerful people uh, right? yeah, oh, it, was like, yeah, it essentially becomes the five greatest people in history so I think Genghis Khan is another one okay uh, King Arthur okay and, and then the, the thing that turns out wait wait who's the other ones what well, come on I can't Do remember one but the, 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 fourth, the fourth one ends up being Jack West Jr what <laughs> no it doesn't at the end they can't figure out who the fifth one is but Jack West Jr we should point out if anyone is not following along is the protagonist of the series. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it turns out he was a chosen one all along? Essentially, yeah. So the fifth... The, sorry, the, the, I keep saying the fifth and sixth book because they're five and six. They're counting down. The second yeah. and third book uh, establish a lot more that even before this capstone thing, there's a lot more to that. And there was like an ancient advanced, like probably comparable to like the Atlantean race. Right. This advanced one that set up all these rituals and all this magic. Right, okay. And they apparently had the ability to see the future. Well, now I just really want to... Read the other books, yeah. but we'll get to those maybe in a later episode, maybe not it, on the podcast. It, at all. It's more of the same, so if, if you, I definitely <laughs> want to read it. Then um, one thing I'd like to talk about is you said this was his first book that features an Australian protagonist. I think so. Yeah, this book and the ending in particular. I don't know if you remember. Oh yeah, yeah. Is very pro-Australian. It is um, um, in a way that I, as an Australian, very much enjoyed. <laughs> and I remember somebody like reading a discussion once about one of why his movies would never, or why his books never became movies. Mm. And part of that was like, so a lot of the other books really pander to the US. So it's like, right. it's the same character as Jack West Jr. Like it's but just with a, a different US name. Marine yeah, instead it's of a, a US yeah. Marine, and it's all very pro-US. And, like, I remember somebody, like, reading something where somebody was saying that they thought he was doing that because it's easier to get Hollywood to buy into it if it's very pro <laughs> yeah, For this book, he's just like, fuck it, I'm going back to my um, roots. Yeah, and, uh, and even the latest one of those, so it's the Scarecrow series is the one where it's the US Marine, who is right. basically the same character. And in the latest one of those, it actually... <laughs> like his go- left arm is burning instead of his <laughs> right arm. Um, it goes very anti-US in the fourth book in that series, and I think that might just be the point where oh, one of his movie deals went down. And he's like, "Screw it, screw the US, <laughs> screw Hollywood. I'll show um, them what I really think of and them." So that's one through where, the lens of Scarecrow. Yeah, I forget the name of that book, but it's it's like China versus the US is the driving thing, and the US team of Marines that go there, they eventually decide that they're siding with China on this one, and right. And sort of stop. There's a plot by the US to like kill everyone in China. So now in this book, the US are one of the main groups of villains. The other being yeah. Europe slash the Vatican. Yes. So this book is uh, Jack West Jr. and his team are kind of outside of. There's Europe and America fighting for and then there's like competition. This mini conglomerate. And then there's just <laughs> a couple of other countries: Ireland, um, Iran, and. So New Zealand, Australia. New Zealand, yeah. And Although they just, just kind of have their own little... They, they they don't want anyone to get this superpower. Yeah. Uh, so that at the end of the book, it's a fight between Europe and America to see who's going to control this magical power that will give them dominance over the world for the next thousand years or whatever. Uh, and Europe is knocked out of the race and it seems like America's going to come in and then Jack West Jr. comes in. And at the end, it's revealed that Jack West Jr. tricked them into doing the ritual for America, uh, for Australians. Yes. And so now, at the end of the book... There's a quote from Jack West Jr. where he says, I mean, they're talking about how Australians basically are now super powered. It, it's more like in terms of like a combat with another nation, like Australians are sort of invincible through like, I think they go into it more. Maybe I thought it was at the end of this book. It might be the southern next one, but it's like, like when all the Australians fighting in the Middle East, it's like whenever they're about to die, it was like the bomb just wouldn't work or the enemy's guns would jam. Yeah, so there's a scene in here. And he might retcon how exactly the powers work, but Jack West Jr., the the thing happens, and then Jack West Jr. is an Australian, so he has this power, and someone is about to shoot him, and he makes the gun explode. Okay. And it doesn't shoot him. Yeah, so they definitely don't have, like, like conscious superpowers like yeah, that. Yeah, but in this book, it seems like they really do. <laughs> and so it ends with um, Jack West Jr. talking about how Australians are not a warfaring people, and so they... It's, it's fine. It's for the best that they have this power... <laughs> And they won't know about the power. They won't know that they can make guns explode, but yeah. they can do it secretly. And so it's it's a very weird ending where it's just kind of Matthew Riley being like, yeah, suck it. You know, oh, Australians are the best. <laughs> we're the it, best country and now we're super powered. It gets even better. So uh, the first chapter of the next book 
is it turns out that on the exact opposite side of the world to the pyramids of Giza, like through the earth on the exact opposite yes, point, okay. uh, in uh, in the Easter Islands, okay, there's like an like an underground pyramid with a dark capstone, and <laughs> a year later they do a spell there, oh, and it undoes so it undoes the spell it's from so the first beautiful. book, like. So he just sort of, in the first chapter of the second book, immediately just undoes. <laughs> yeah. Because you can't continue a book where one no. nation in the world just has superpowers. It um, makes no sense. Yeah, and then the second book becomes like, all about, like, so then it turns out... There are so many logistical problems, like, what about immigration? What yeah. about expats going overseas? <laughs> Do they maintain the power? Like, what happens? Does or is, the it, just, or is it just indigenous <laughs> aborigines? Is it like, just, <laughs> yeah, because Jack West Jr. is a white man, presumably. It's, I don't think it might be explicitly said, but... Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I, I think... I think he is, yeah. So, colonial Australians who are really just long ago criminal British, do British have this power? Are British criminals also? Like, it's if, very, if Australia, very, if very Australia very has the power and they invade somewhere else, so technically those people are now Australians. Yeah, that place becomes Australia. an Australian colony. But then they're mean? rebelling. Yeah. <laughs> what about Tasmania? Tasmania is not part of the Australian mainland, but, you know, do the Tasmanians have the power? I think it's just, just chalk it up to magic. I think um, you definitely have to retcon it because it was um, too inconsistent. Yeah. But uh, the second book, uh, it, it does that, stu- wait, that that sort of silly thing that a lot of sequels will do where it's just like escalates. So you know how mm. the driving plot of this first one is a giant sunspot that's going to take over the world. Not destroy the world, well, just, uh, unless they do this ritual. It's going to yeah, basically well, destroy the world. Yes. It's going to cause hyper-global warming, basically. Yes. So the second book, then it turns out that that was actually just a lead-up to there's actually like a dark sun made out of dark matter so you can't see it but it's coming into the solar system and it'll tear the whole thing up so it's just like so he goes from like a big sun spot to now the bad guy is a whole sun a whole sun (laughs) yeah and then it's going to be a whole solar system is the Mm. next one and so then they need to do this big magic ritual all over the world to stop that sun jesus from um destroying the whole solar system what's the next book called the six six sacred stones Oh, that's not as gripping. I don't um, think. No, it's not. And then it goes because, to Five Greatest Warriors, and then I can't remember what the new one's called that comes out in a few months. Because in this movie, the Seven Ancient Wonders are a thing. I mean, some of them are fictitious, like mm. the Hanging Gardens, which does appear in well, this book. Yeah, I mean, they were meant to have existed at some point, but... See, I don't know if the Hanging Gardens was meant to exist. I'm, I'm fairly sure it is one of the Seven Ancient Wonders. I think it is, but I, I think it also is a bit... Um, well, I mean, nobody, like... It's not still around. And I don't think it's ever been found. Yeah, exactly. But it is found in this book. Exactly. And this is one of the scenes where I can really imagine it as a movie, where they're entering into this cavern, and there's this giant stalactite in front of them, which just has this kind of circular path going, a a spiral path around it that just is full of, like, overgrown. And you can just think to yourself, this should be... Like, (laughs) you can see it, the camera panning up and zooming out as they see this giant cavern that they're in. Yeah, that should definitely be a movie. Now, one other thing I want to talk about is you mentioned in the preamble to this episode that he has a bionic arm, Mm. uh, but I think you're being intentionally vague because there are a lot of things in this book that are just... I think awesome is the word. (laughs) Awesome is the word you're looking for, right? Um, uh, Where it's just... Or or awe-inspiring, or the original Mini Awesome, where it just just fills you with awe. Um, there's a lot of science fiction nonsense in this book. Like, they have a flying... They have a jet. It's a 747, but it doesn't fly normally. It kind of hovers, right? Yeah, it's, it's very it's loose, like a hover loose interpretation of physics. Yes. <laughs> and there is a mechanical arm. Jack West Jr. has a mechanical arm. Yeah. And he has a pet falcon, which he can command and yes. understands him perfectly. There are a lot of nonsense things. I want to talk about how he lost his arm, which is that... Yes. He, so was that was a, actually... I tried to get my sisters to read this book, yeah. and that was the point where they stopped. When he lost See, his arm... See, that's interesting. That was where they were like, this book is terrible. Yes. Because it's about one chapter in from me. Uh, yeah, I think it's one or two <laughs> chapters in they describe how he lost his arm, and it's just... It's insane. He So, <laughs> the plot is there are these two oracles that are mm. born in this ceremony ten years before the book started. Um, and so he gets there, and the 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 uh, Vatican has just taken away the first oracle and it turns out oh no there were twins and this second oracle is being born yeah. and so Jack West Jr goes in and, and gets the second child and the chamber starts filling up with lava and he notices that there's a button behind some lava that he has to push and so what he does is he grabs his hand and he reaches in through the lava and pushes the button as his hand gets like burnt off yeah. and is melt off melted off and then he's getting built a robotic arm later but that's not interesting because he's just reached through lava to press a button <laughs> and there's just a lot of scenes like that where nonsense happens but it's just so 
it's so engaging to read about this nonsensical <laughs> thing happening that you just can't put it down. Yeah. I think I think I also said that the um the bionic arm gets used a lot, which which yeah, now that's now, a lie. Now, that's a lie. Yeah, I, there there is one scene where he uses it to punch a dude, and the dude is just like oh, fuck you and punches him back. Yeah, but I think that's the only time it's ever explicitly referred to. So there's a scene. I think I was thinking of a scene that must be in the second book, and it's mm. with um Jack West Jr.'s father. Who's the Jack West Senior? Yes, who's the who's the back bad Not guy? In this book so at all. he's the bad guy in the second book. There, mm-hmm. so I, I I'm clearly showing the the years since I've read it. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you want me to spoil too much what happens in do this it, scene. Do it. Um, so his his father essentially crucifies him on a rock. Jesus fucking um, Christ! This book. <laughs> this and then book. and there's so there's a hole in the ground that's the same size as the rock. He's on like a square rock. Okay. And so they put him on the side facing the hole and they push the rock and so it's like down flat, into the hole like yeah so, so and so it fits perfectly in the hole and it's the rock's just going to squish him hmm. and so eventually they think he's dead for like a quarter of the book and then eventually he comes back and like what he did is because they put it through his robotic hand because his dad like either forgot or didn't know that he had a but robotic hand it's pretty hand. obvious that he's got it right it I looks guess, like I guess a, not but anyway so he no. pulls that one out and may, basically manages to like stand with his elbow up, and that keeps the rock from squishing him. And then he pulls his feet and hands out, like he grabs the nail that has his hand in no, and pulls it out. No, he doesn't. Yeah, he does. <laughs> uh, and then Jesus manages to Christ. survive being crucified and crushed by the rock. And it's just like it, it's just so stupid. And I love it. <laughs> it's great. This, yeah. See, in some ways, this book is so bad it's good, and then in other ways, it's just very engaging, despite or because of how absurd it is and how. It doesn't take itself seriously, thank exactly. fucking God. Because yeah. if it did, it would be a disaster. Um, and so I think that's where the interviews come in at the end. Because the interviews yes, give let's you a talk bit about of a... these interviews. They give you an insight into Matthew Riley's brain, don't they? Yeah. Oh, well, it's interesting because it, you would think from those interviews that he takes himself quite seriously. But the book the book doesn't give you that impression. Yeah, it definitely doesn't. Because right, the book knows that it's almost a popcorn book. Yeah. So one of the questions here is, what did you try to do differently with this book? And his response to the question that he's presumably asking himself is that he wanted to create... He says, For me, the key difference between Seven Deadly Wonders and my previous books is the theme of family in it. And of course, I, don't I guess that. that's loosely <laughs> into that. Because these, these kind of international conglomerate of nations have each sent one or two people and they kind of become this ramshackle family. Yeah. But it's clear that he is taking that far more <laughs> seriously than anyone else does in the book. Um... But yeah, this, I don't know how to describe this book. If I had to sum it up in one word, I would say this book is insane. No, awesome. 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 It's the one word you need. Awesome. This is definitely an awesome book. It's terrible, (laughs) but it's amazing at the same time. Um, And so I would give it a, God, a seven and a half out of ten, maybe. Yeah, Yeah, I think a seven and a half out of ten is justified here. It's worth experiencing, I think. A a Matthew Riley book. I don't know if you have to read all of them. I mean, I don't but know. I think I can't should read give my stamp to any of the other ones, but this one is just fucking balls to the wall crazy. Yeah, loved it. Loved it. 